Thank, thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be the least talented person you'll see tonight on this stage. I, I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. And I want to say that I've always had a long and uh, a very interesting uh, thoughts about alchemy. I was always interested in alchemy as a child, and I always wondered who were these alchemists who had convinced all these kings and emperors that he could make gold? And I would love to have been a fly on the wall to hear that sales pitch. But al interestingly enough, our modern alchemists, who you'll see tonight, have the same experience as the old alchemists, because if they don't create gold, they too are killed. Thank thankfully only by critics. Collaboration is, a, is really a remarkable phenomenon. And I believe, and I've been saying for many years, that the only alchemy truly that has ever been created by man is on the stage. So I would like to introduce tonight Robert Viagas. Robert Viagas and I have met, done many projects together. He's my good luck charm, and he's my partner on many projects at Playbill. He helped me create Playbill.com helped me create Playbill Radio, helped me create the Playbill Yearbook and Playbill Books. I doubt I could have done anything without his collaboration. So I'd like to introduce a very special man who was able to put this very special book together, Robert Viagas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. What an exciting time it was working on this project. Let me... Uh, tell you a little bit about it. Uh, while it's true that the essence of drama is conflict, the essence of creating drama turns out to be cooperation. And in the world of theater, that kind of cooperation among people of enormous talent placed under enormous stress is called collaboration. The, world mean, the word means only working together, but in practice, it means that one plus one can sometimes equal three. Things are created that neither of two collaborators would have created on their own. Our society puts a lot of focus on the benefits of competition. And while competition may be exciting to watch, it's not always where the highest magic happens. My guests tonight are some of the greatest practitioners of this divine art, outstandingly talented people who have perfected the ability to play well with others. They share their wisdom in our new book, The Alchemy of Theater, a series of 27 remarkable essays on the art of collaboration. I hope my guests will forgive me for truncating their credits so severely, but they're so amazingly accomplished. We could spend hours just marveling over their resumes. Briefly then, Edward Albee, one of the iconic American playwrights of the past half century. He's won the Pulitzer Prize three times for A Delicate Balance, Seascape, and Three Tall Women. Along with his classic, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, and many others, he has shocked us, outraged us, and educated us about ourselves. His essay, Creation and Interpretation, is a bold assertion of the rights of playwrights. Harold Prince. Winner of 21 Tony Awards, the most of any individual ever, helped bring us Cabaret, Evita, Fiddler on the Roof, and West Side Story, to name just a few. And those don't even include his legendary collaboration with composer Stephen Sondheim, for whom Mr. Prince directed original productions of Follies, Company, A Little Night Music, and Sweeney Todd. And he also found time to stage the longest-running show in Broadway history, The Phantom of the Opera. If you wonder what such an artist considers the perfect collaboration, just read his essay of that title in our book. Though our, the next essayist, Terence McNally, has won Tony Awards for his brilliant plays, Master Class and Love, Valor, Compassion, we asked him to write about his award-winning work as a librettist of musicals, including The Full Monty, The Rink, Kiss of the Spider Woman, A Man of No Importance, and Ragtime. The result was an essay titled, A Blueprint for the House, comparing his work to that of an architect. Some of Mr. McNally's recent work has been in collaboration with lyricist Lynn Ahrens and composer Stephen Flaherty. But they've been writing musicals together since 1982, creating scores to Lucky Stiff, My Favorite Year, Susicle, A Man of No Importance, and Dessa Rose. And they won the Tony Award for Best Score 
for ragtime. In our book, they write about what it's like to work as a collaboration within a collaboration in the beautifully titled, A Place You Couldn't Find on Your Own. Kathleen Chalfont's award-winning stage career has featured major productions on Broadway, off-Broadway, and in London's West End, but she's perhaps best remembered for playing Dr. Vivian Baring, a poetry professor facing cancer in the Pulitzer-winning drama Wit, and for playing several different roles in Tony Kushner's modern epic Angels in America. One of America's finest actors, she explains the many ways a performer collaborates in her essay, Playing Both Parts. The fact that these marvelous artists agreed to write essays for Alchemy of Theater and are here tonight speaks to the importance that they attach to the act of collaboration. Their lessons apply not just to the theater, but to the wider world as well. We're going to bring them out now. We're going to talk for about 60 minutes, and then we will take your questions. Ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to sit back a little bit so you can see Mr. Prince over here. Um, okay, I'm going to jump right in. Can and, we uh, ask a question first? Please do, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Albee. We can't see anybody in the, in no. the house. Can the They're there, be, though. Can the lights be put up, please? Are you there? Is it possible to raise the house lights just a bit? Perfect. Oh, that's... Yeah. That helps. Yeah. Oh, that's more, good. more, more. <laughs> more. A little more? <laughs> yeah, we want to see people. There you go. There right. you Hi. Are. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm going to jump right in. Um, who were role models who showed you how to collaborate, and what do you remember them teaching you? Mr. Prince. Well, I, I, was, uh, I was a stage manager for a, a few years, about five, and uh, the directors on the projects that I stage managed were George Abbott and Jerome Robbins. <laughs> a, a good teaching process. Actually, they were utterly different in their methods and even in what they demanded of the actors and mostly what they were seeking from the material they were working on. Uh, Abbott was from the old school. Uh, he was completely disciplined, uh, no nonsense. Uh, it was a, a job, a creative one, albeit. I think, by the way, since he had been uh, Robbins' mentor, Jerry learned that from him, but of course anybody who also worked as a choreographer had that. Uh, but uh, Abbott primarily wanted to entertain, and what you'd say is, what, what, uh, why, you do, wh why do you do what you do? And he'd always say, I want to entertain people. I, I think Jerry's was a, a different priority, he, but interestingly enough, he wanted hits. Uh, I guess that, they, that's sort of the same kind of thing, really, think about it. But the truth is, learning from them, I learned discipline, I learned truth, I learned no nonsense, no self-indulgence, and then separately, uh, uh, very important things. Uh, I'll make this very brief. From Jerry Robbins, I can't, by the way, I, I should preface this by saying I cannot dance. I have either two left or two right feet. I'm not sure which, but I know that I, I can't do that. But I could learn from him uh, patterns of movement uh, that were new to musical theater that Abbott had. Ab Abbott worked so much of his life laterally. The other drop came in and people crossed the stage back and forth and they changed the scenery upstage. Then everything changed. Uh, uh, very probably most dramatically with, with West Side Story. And so I could see that, that dancers moved uh, in clumps at you, directly at the audience, or diagonally, or turned their backs when you least expected it and moved away. And that those were very dynamic, energetic moves. Uh, in, a, in a word, I learned all that sort of thing and then uh, purloined it 
for a man with feet that don't move. I purloined it. And, and so I learned those things from those gentlemen, plus a lot of encouragement to go on and do what I wanted to do. Now, we have three people here who have worked together on a number of projects. Lynn Aaron, Stephen Flaherty, and Terrence McNally have worked together on several wonderful shows that we've all enjoyed, uh, most notably, I think, Ragtime. What's it like to work as uh, two people uh, as collaborating with one another and then working three together? Hmm. Well, if they're Lynn and Stephen, it's wonderful. It's fine. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> uh, with other people, it's not so wonderful. But mm -hmm. I always feel they are a team, though. Uh, right. so but how did you learn to, to collaborate? The, the, I know that uh, uh, Ms. Ahrens and Mr. Flaherty were in the, the BMI workshop. Did they teach you there how to do that? Or is it just lessons that you learned as you went along? No, I, I think a lot of it is things that we picked up as we went along. Uh, the, the, th the BMI workshop is a wonderful um, place for composers and lyricists to meet. And uh, when I first came to New York, I was writing both words and music. And that was really the first time that I ever collaborated uh, with a, a, a lyricist with another songwriting partner. And that's the, the, when I realized that it's, uh, the, the goal of it is not about just your, um, your personal vision, it's, it's, a, it's about a group vision, in, in our case, uh, the vision of a duo. And then uh, uh, what BMI taught was really the craft of songwriting, not really the craft of collaboration beyond collaboration for songwriting. So. Uh, a lot of that uh, is things that I picked up. Uh, the, the first major director that I had the great fortune to work with was Graciela Danielle, uh, who's a wonderful director as well as a choreographer. And that's the first time uh, that, I, that I really began to delve into the notion of uh, telling stories through music and dance, you know, without, without lyrics. So that was a real breakthrough and interesting time for me. I, th I think... Um, Collaboration is one of those mystical things, and it's, it's kind of like falling in love and getting married louder. It, it either works or it doesn't work, um, and, it, and a lot of it has to do with personality and, and um, the specifics of how uh, the, the chemistry between people. Um, when Stephen and I met in 1983, for some reason, our collaboration just clicked. We have a similar sensibility, a similar uh, sense of um, what's funny, and we both like to drink coffee. And uh, you know, there are things that we have in common in life. And um, it, it seems to have worked out. When, when we started working on Ragtime with Terrence, it was um, a very, very interesting uh, change because up until uh, then, we had mostly worked just with each other. Um, and I had written book for a number of musicals. And, and um, working with Terrence was a real revelation because it showed how uh, a playwright who is a brilliant, brilliant playwright can write these magnificent monologues and scenes and offer them up to his collaborators without any sense of ego, without any sense of this is the best thing I've ever written and it's got to get into the show. He would allow us to take them and turn them into songs. And I purloined some of his greatest uh, scenes, I think, for Ragtime and, and they became songs in the show. Um, so it, it, it was a wonderful uh, experience to work with him, uh, you know, as a songwriting team. And I personally found myself being the bridge in a certain way between the spoken scenes and the music. And I was kind of segueing everything. I was the, the, the seamstress in the middle, weaving the, <laughs> the spoken word into song and, and, you know, placing it delicately on the musical notes. So um, in terms of collaboration between the three of us, that's, that's kind of... How it uh, Mr. McNally. Uh, I didn't have role models when I began in the theater. I was too, but there are people whose work I admired. But I found role models as I worked in the theater. People who taught you to and collaborate. And I learned a lot from working with Lynn and Stephen. Lynn is a very, she really uh, cracks the whip a lot. And I, I needed it at that point. How I'd sit I learned, next to him at the computer. The day, the day the phone rang and it was Hal Prince asking if I wanted to work on the, a libretto for Kiss of the Spider Woman, I knew I would learn enormously from working with this man, and I'm still learn from the, the people I work with, but I think that, I think we find our, our particular role models as we have our lives in the theater. Now, collaboration doesn't necessarily mean just giving away the store. Uh, there's, there are times when you have to hold the line in a collaboration. Now, Mr. Albee, when you and I were working on, on this, you, you uh, to a degree, were disagreeing with the, the fundamental concept of the book that we were working on. Um, <laughs> 
uh, you have very strong feelings on the, the first person in a the first person to come on the scene when a, when a show is being produced is the writer, and you're the first person that comes in on it. Please describe yeah, but, your, but, your but before feelings any, on collaboration. Before any playwright can collaborate with the people that he's supposed to collaborate with in our theater, directors, actors, producers, critics, and audiences, for example, he's got to learn to collaborate and learn a great deal from uh, people like Sophocles and Shakespeare and Chekhov and Beckett and people like that. He's, he's got to learn his craft so completely that when he's expected to collaborate, he knows when the collaboration asked of him is healthy and good or whether it is corrupt and merely commercial. But you were, uh, but you were also making, a, you also made a, a point about, um, uh, we were talking about workshops and the way a lot of plays are created today. You were saying that uh, young playwrights are under a lot of pressure perhaps to collaborate too much. A lot of playwrights are, are well, let me go back a, a step here and talk about an experience that I had during the first day of rehearsal of my play, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? A four character, one set play, remember? Uh, <laughs> my producer, Richard Barr, took me down a hall to a room where we were gonna have the first, the first rehearsal. I came into this room and there were 75 people there. One set, four character play. There were the four actors, their agents, their agents' assistants, the understudies, their agents, the director, his assistants, their agents, the, all the producers, the designers and their assistants and their agents. There were 75 people in there. And I said, Richard, what does this mean? He said, I want you to remember one thing, Edward. I don't want you ever to get a swell head over this, but none of these people would be here if you hadn't written the play. And that taught me something very, yeah. very useful, mm -hmm. that working with other people is essential uh, uh, in the theater, absolutely essential. But uh, nobody would be there if the play hadn't been written first. And that shouldn't give us the, the right to uh, do wrong things. That shouldn't give us the right to be ornery for the sake of being ornery. But uh, it's healthy to keep it in the back of your mind in the tough times. <laughs> <laughs> Our other playwright, Mr. McNally, wanted to make I, I was hoping Kathleen would be willing to share some about the play development, which ended up in Angels in America, which one? through a very, very long development and uh, well, I a very that, successful one. So. I thought that would lead to yeah, talking right. about um, what it was like in a situation where an actor is, is working with the playwright during the creation of a play. Now, you were there for the creation of uh, Millennium Approaches and Perestroika, the two parts of Angels in America, and I know that uh, Mr. Kushner absorbs a lot from his actors as well. Can you describe that uh, process? And well, what did you learn from that? It's, um, it was interesting. There were three of us who, who came with the dinner, if you like, were there from the beginning. Steve Spinella, Ellen McLaughlin, and I were involved with Angels in America from the earliest readings of it in 1988. Well, actually, Ellen and Stephen were there before in 1987. And Tony had different, but, but I want to say that Tony does very much what um, Edward was talking about, defends the text. If the writer isn't the defender of the text, um, the entire enterprise is on a, on uh, shaky ground, and I think it can't be said uh, m m more clearly or held to more fiercely that the text is the thing upon which the entire edifice is built. And even a play like Angels in America, which was written over a period of some, uh, uh, the, the entire thing was over a period of a little under three years. Um, um, and it was written while it was being done. There were, we had huge workshop uh, events and all like that, but there were parts of the play that never changed from the first reading to the end, and they were the essential building blocks of the play. 
and the rest of it grew up around it. Um, and people who write like Tony and like Edward and like Terence don't ever usually write badly, but you can't always have it all in the play. <laughs> and that, I mean, that, cutting. <laughs> yeah, that that became an issue. And Tony collaborated in different ways with different with different actors, depending upon and and different members of the collaborative team. Because, as you can imagine, over all that time, there were an awful lot of people involved. Ellen, for instance, is a playwright herself, and they were very. They had a great deal to say about writing and the craft of writing, and I think that that was important. Um, for Tony, Stephen is uh, was Tony's first one of Tony's first artistic collaborators. Um, I think I said it all right, so it was good. You know, Tony could hear it if I said it. Um, <laughs> there okay. were there was one very interesting thing that happened though, because as the play grew and we got to be a family, and um, I'm still not sure if it was the right thing. There was a, a plot point in the play about whether or not Harper would have an abortion. And um, um, the, and not only whether or not she would have an abortion, but whether the abortion in the play would be a triumph or a moment of great sorrow, how it should be dealt with. And when we began, everybody was much younger, and the men were much younger. And so for a while, um, this issue was considered, was thought of as a political issue, and we were all, you know, somewhere to the left of, any, as far left as you could possibly get, so it was clear <laughs> what our views were politically. But what began to happen is that the women in the play, and it was, there, weren't so, there weren't so many women in the making of this play, but we all began to say that, that, that the fact of an abortion is a much more complex idea. It's not a political idea when you do it yourself. There's the, defending, the defense of the right of it, and then there's the doing of it. And um, we, it was odd over, it took three years. We had, we had an effect. In the end, we brought people around. It was not only a, um, a lesson in, in collaboration in the building of a company, but a little bit in, in political, in growing political awareness. Um, Angels in America was a particularly rich experience because so many of us were together for so long. And it, grew, um, in a way it grew like Topsy, and I think Tony would say that, especially Perestroika. Millennium Approaches, uh, Tony knew what the structure of it would be. And Perestroika, in fact, turned into two plays in the end. There are, a number of, there are a number of playwrights who like yeah. to work that way. August Wilson yeah. worked that way, would follow his plays production after production after production, altering them as they went on before they got to New York. Yeah. And you go even further to somebody like uh, the relationship between Jean-Claude Van Italy and Joe Chaikin, Absolutely. where the plays were written between the director and, and mm -hmm. the actors uh, and the playwright working together in an improvisatory fashion. But, but I think but there comes a time when, this, when whoever is defending the text must defend the text. Of course. And yeah. that's uh, the, the... And that ties into a question that you asked that I, that I, didn't, that I didn't answer, then I'll shut up. Uh, <laughs> oh. Young playwrights these days have a far tougher time, given the economics of our theater, uh, than they used to have back in, in the in late 50s and early 60s when I began. More and more young playwrights are being told, you want us to do your play, even in a regional theater. You want us to do your play? It's a wonderful play. We love it. However, don't you think maybe you're being a little hard on the audience? Don't you think you could sand off some of the rough edges and make it a little bit safer? And a young playwright who's trying to, you know, support a family, what do you do in, in a situation like that? It's, it's getting tougher for playwrights to hold the line against commerce all the time in our theater. It's a shame. Now, it's, it's interesting. Yes. Actually, that, this... This reminds me of, of a point, actually, that in my conversations with Mr. Prince, when we were working on a project, uh, we were working on, on uh, uh, the foundation of his essays, 
Uh, now you were talking about um, Mr. Alba. You were you wrote a play, uh, The Goat or Who Is Sylvia, a very controversial subject matter. Really? <laughs> Some people I mean, seem yeah, to feel I know, so. I know I wrote it. I didn't realize. Some it people like seem that. to feel so, and you were you were. Uh, uh, when I was thinking about that, it reminded me of a point that Mr. Prince made. Mr. Prince was saying that if people uh, people think that taking chances is non-commercial, that 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 actually cuts into the audience. Whereas now your play, uh, The Goater Who Is Sylvia, not only did well, it won the Tony Award, and, uh, and it, it showed that being controversial, going out on a limb can be very commercial, and that was a point, Mr. Prince, that you made in, in our conversations as well. You were saying, why didn't people take more, uh, chances. more chances? That Now you're coming down to the question of a pers uh, an artist, a stage artist's collaboration with the audience, and the audience's collaboration back. Well, there's no question that we're, we're, we're all sitting at this table, all knowing that there's been a terrible sea change in terms of opportunities for uh, people to do serious work and in the theater. And it all does get down to money. It gets down to production costs, which have escalated and continue to escalate. But there's a terrible misinterpretation on the part of producers. I, I'm of the opinion that what the theater lacks most is creative producing. Uh, there are so many incredibly talented people out there, and they're not getting their chance. They're not getting their chance to fail. And it's, of course, out of failure that you learn probably more than you do success. I don't think too many of us sit around after us a hit and say, well, now what did we do, and how come that turned into a hit? do it again. I don't think that what, what did we do? How, how, you, how you were one of the last of the creative producers, right. and you got tired at last, and wanted I to concentrate on directing. Yeah. Let me say oh, this. We miss you. I was, a, hey, thank you, I miss me too. As a producer. <laughs> Uh, but no, for I, someone I who's you. so missed, it's so gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, the, the, you know, I, not not to bore you with figures, but the figures were you, you could do a full uh, talk in musical terms because musicals were always more expensive to do than plays. But you could do a, a big, uh, full Broadway musical for uh, finance it for two hundred and fifty thousand and spend one hundred and sixty-four. I did that twice in a row mm -hmm. early in my career. Um, the, the fact is that you could then interest investment money from people who wanted to be part of your venture, not to be part of an investment. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge difference between having 175 people averaging $1,000 a piece who want to be able to say, you know, I have a piece of that show that that's going to close next month, but I'm very, <laughs> but it very was proud tonight. of it. Right. It's the truth. And we've lost that. And instead, what we've gotten is large corporate money, money from hugely uh, wealthy people. And you know, it, it, I, I have no mechanical brain at all. So if a car breaks down, I just go help. <laughs> Stand by the side of the road, uh, look for a phone, and get somebody to come and get me out of this trouble. Uh, but the theater is a very odd place where people feel a sort of expertise which they have absolutely no right to feel. <laughs> you came here to be insulted. <laughs> no, but you know, you got it. And, and the point is, uh, I didn't quit because I wanted to quit, and I make a very direct relationship to uh, 20 years of my career, perhaps more, and the fact that I kept picking the projects and hiring the director, me, <laughs> and, uh, and the uh, the point is that you could go out and take terrible chances because you, it had been proven to you that audiences would go along with your collaborators and you, that they wanted a journey that they didn't expect. Now today, with costs as high as they are, I couldn't raise that money. Mm -hmm. So I have to work much less than I used to and than I'd like to because I'd like to work a lot. And the point is, it, it's finding the scratch to get these things on, and it always involves uh, an awful lot of, of uh, demographics and surveys 
And a, a lot of, you guys know what I'm talking about, a lot of what did the audience make of the show tonight? What five minutes w were they happiest? What 10 minutes were they most unhappy? And all the rest of it, and what worked last year? That's one of the damnedest things about <laughs> the commercial theater, that anyone should think that work, what worked last year is what somebody wants to see Thanks. next year. Mm. Quite the opposite. That's what is got true. the Ford Motor Company in such trouble. Yes, yeah, true. <laughs> it's absolutely true. But you know what? You can't break. You can't break people of that thinking. Or at least I've been unable to. And there's no question. I stopped because I wouldn't know where to find ten million dollars to do something that cost one hundred and sixty-four thousand. What seems like yesterday to me, anyway. But now. Uh, Theater, we think of theater as happening on the stage, but really the theater happens inside the audience, out in the house. What happens on the stage is designed to evoke theater in the audience. What kind of, how can the audiences collaborate with you? How do you like, how do you collaborate with an audience? Do you? They do, that's the do you purpose listen to of the enterprise. Well, there, describe how that happens. Well, because it's not true to say that the play happens in the audience. The play happens in the coming together of the, the play and the audience, and it doesn't really exist unless there's an audience. When, when Stephen and I first started working together, um, the very, very, very first show that we ever had produced was by an organization called Theater Works USA, which is a children's theater organization. Where I'm working right now. They're great. <laughs> and it was an incredibly invaluable experience for us. And, and what came out of it for me was learning to listen to an audience. Um, because we had a thousand or so children at town hall with our very first little show on the stage. And it was so clear when they were interested, they leaned forward, they were very quiet. When they were confused or bored, they stood up, threw food, ran up the aisle, <laughs> went, asked to go to the bathroom. And we, I realized that children are really little adults. You know, they're just a little shorter and a little less controlled. And adults will rustle and look at their watches if they're confused or bored. And you, as a, as a writer, you learn to um, sit in the back of the audience in previews and kind of try to sense what the audience is reacting to or not reacting to, where they're getting restless and so forth. And in that sense, it is a collaboration. And, and just to add that, we did have one experience on Ragtime where we had a producer, we don't have enough time to tell stories about that experience, but um, he, this particular producer, who was a brilliant creative producer, Garth Drabinsky, did do market research, which uh, was horrifying to us. It was very upsetting to us. And we never looked once at it. We, would, we, we were like, don't tell us what, you know, what one of these songs might make a good jingle. We could give a damn. You know, we just wanted to do our work, and we did. And we never, uh, I have to say, we never ever looked at research. We were never shown research. We, we wrote the show, and we listened to the audience. Um, and in that sense, I think, uh, you know, on that particular show, we were we, we did the same thing that we do on every show, whether a producer brings us a project or whether we self-generate a project and, and find something we just love and want to work on. We, we um, that's our process, to write it for ourselves and once it gets up in front of an audience to, to kind of try and shape it so that other people can feel what we feel about it. But when all is said and done, I do believe we write for ourselves and, you know, what touches us. I, I think that's totally true and I think also in a collaboration you write for one another as well you know you really trust uh, in a good collaboration the people that you're that you're working with and I don't think that there was a single time ever that we ever tried to simplify something but I think there were there were many many times where we needed to clarify certain moments that that were clear to us but for whatever reason were not clear to the audience and uh, in terms of presentation or even something as simple as sound design or orchestration, you know, uh, very, very subtle things and you're constantly analyzing, you know, every, every moment of, of, the, the, um, of the play, trying to make sure that the idea is, is coming across to the audience. I don't think uh, of the audience as a collaborator, however, I think it as a character that is the last element, character element as the last one to be introduced into the process that goes from writing to rehearsal 
through previews, but not as a collaborator, but as Kathleen said, when what we're doing on the stage comes meets somewhere out there with the audience, it's thrilling. And most playwrights, and Lynn and Steve and I would stand at the back of the theater during previews of a, the shows we've done together, and you really don't need a critic or anyone to tell you when the audience is fully engaged and where we've lost them. And then uh, you go home and try to make those restless moments fewer. I, I'd, I'd like to just add a word to that whole business about audience as collaborator. Uh, it, it, it's a, I've had experiences where I would consider them such, and I'll tell you what I'm getting at. Early on, I learned that you should be secure enough to listen to everyone. Mm. That doesn't mean you do what everyone right. tells you to do, but you've got to listen. And I have found over the years that walking from the fourth row on the aisle, just as the lights are about to go up and leave the theater at, on a show that I'm directing, I can hear somebody say something, and I've been caught caught in the act of being lazy. Because there's a certain point in the whole process where I think, oh, it's working, it's really working, we're okay. And then some total stranger <laughs> goes up the aisle and says, but that moment, and I think, oh, lady, you, you caught me. nailed me. <laughs> and uh, I rush backstage, and uh, yeah. we go back to work. But the, in, in that respect, they are, they are and can collaborate with you. The problem is, of course, you, you just have to listen ultimately to yourself and, and your active collaborators when you're working. Um, it, we're lucky enough this evening to have uh, writers, pro, uh, writers, directors, actors on our panel, but the Alchemy of Theater, we have essays from all the different people who work on a show because everybody has to collaborate on a show, we have uh, we have an essay by uh, uh, a, uh, we have an essay by set designer Robin Wagner, costume designer William Ivy Long, lighting designers Jules Fisher and Peggy Eisenhower, sound designers, orchestrator, makeup designer. All these people work on the project, and all of them have a part in the project. And many of you have to work with all these people. I'd like to ask. Tell uh, uh, perhaps a story, an anecdote of something where you remember collaborating with somebody, perhaps not what, the, what we think of as a collaboration. Actually, we think of a composer and lyricist collaborating together, but collaborating with a choreographer, with, with a costume designer, with a set designer. Well, for actors, the most intimate relationship in the design world is with a costume designer. And it's always fraught. And always, when they're wonderful designers, they can give you the character. Because you know that what a wonderful designer can do is you quite often work together, but they can give you the character's body, which is very, very important. And the best costume designers um, get past the first meeting, which is when you go in and say, oh, God, oh I'm, that's a uh, color I can't, I never, couldn't <laughs> possibly wear that color. And you mean, I, I think a little longer and higher heels, don't you think? And maybe, you know, uh, and don't you think she should be gorgeous? <laughs> um, <laughs> then you get, <laughs> you get past that negotiation, and and if you it's uh, so you can find this enormously fruitful um, examination of the of the character through that part of the character that other people see, and I, I have a very um, close relationship now with designers because my daughter has become a set designer, and I'm rapidly becoming known as Andromache Chalfant's mother. <laughs> People call up and say, hi, Kathy, how are you? You wouldn't have Andromache's phone number, would you? <laughs> but what people say about her is that she is a great collaborator, because the set designer does for the entire play what the costume designer does for us, which is to provide the world in which everyone needs to walk. I remember once, I once, I once a, a, a uh, costume designer t taught me something yep. absolutely wonderful about costume design. She said, what I do, what I like to do, this is in a naturalistic play, 
I pay a lot of attention to what the actors are wearing at rehearsal. Mm. Huh. Because they are beginning, whether they like it or not, to start dressing like their mm -hmm. character. They are mm -hmm. beginning to turn into their character. And if I pay attention to that, I will get wonderful yeah. ideas and I will learn the kind of clothes that they are comfortable moving mm -hmm. in. That's great. That's, that's so, marvelous. That's so. Mm -hmm. I'm going to note it very soon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, I'm sorry. I, I was really just going to going to say that, that uh, the, the perfect uh, uh, assemblage of artists on a show, from a director's point of view, is when you get surprises from your designers. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're in that weird position of asking for something and getting back exactly what you asked for, you need to be very suspicious of it, because after all, you're not a designer. Right. So it's, it's quite marvelous. The, uh, one of the great collaborations, I was fortunate enough to work with Boris Aronson for years, and, uh, and he, was, he was as stimulating as anyone I've ever worked with in any area of the theater. But he would always uh, talk for six months, and since he was the most articulate and interesting man in the world, and then I wouldn't see anything. <laughs> but we'd talk, and, and what he would do is he would talk about all sensory impressions. Uh, it, uh, in, a, in a particular place that a play took place, he would talk about the smell, the taste, hmm. uh, everything but the look. That, mm -hmm. oh, that never came into mm -hmm. question. And then after six months, he'd come in with something and he always had a, a surprise for me, and I always thought it was a gift. And it was always the extra motor energy that I needed, something that absolutely propelled the, the, the project. I, the, the easiest one to describe is when he gave me what looked like some bare steel structure for company, mm -hmm. he also gave me an elevator. Mm -hmm. And the elevator, <laughs> uh, the elevator could hold the entire company. They could all stand on it on the second floor and go down to the first and then go up the other, other direction. Uh, that, was, that was typical of that uh, collaboration. So in some way he was an auteur, if that, you know, no question. And I always respected that enormously. Uh, may, may I tell one quick story? Um, Please do. Uh, when we wrote Ragtime, just talking about the synergy between designers and writers, um, you know, a lot of times we go into our show and, and we go into technical rehearsals and we're sort of amazed at what's happening and you know it, whoa, whoa I didn't expect that and you know it's it's very fascinating and sometimes scary and on ragtime there was a song that was sung by uh, the character of mother in act two called back to before and it was essentially a song uh, where a, a woman was declaring that um, she was her own person at this point in the show she had um, you know sort of resolved her issues and, and uh, was stepping apart from her husband and, and moving forward with her life no matter what. And um, it was a very interesting uh, experience because the, we were very proud of the song. Marin Maisie was performing it magnificently every night and it was and the audience was very uncomfortable with the moment. And we kept thinking, what's wrong with this picture? Because she's singing it perfectly, she's acting it perfectly, it's all perfect, perfect. And little by little, the designers began to change what we were looking at. And it had begun with her, with sort of storm-tossed hair, her wig was kind of a mess, and she was wearing a grayish-green, stormy-colored gown, and the sky was stormy, grayish-green, and she was singing this song. And it, she looked like a depressed woman, and it was depressing. And then uh, they tidied up her wig, and, um, and then uh, the costume turned, was, was redone and, or rebuilt, and, and it became white. And then the lighting went from stormy gray to gradual dawning of a sunrise. And by the end of the song, this woman in white with her beautiful presence was standing against a, 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 a new dawn. A, a, and it, it became sort of a metaphor for her journey. And it worked so beautifully with the song. And it brought the house down every night. And it was an interesting experience because we knew he'd written a terrific song. The actor was doing it beautifully. And the costume designer and the, and the lighting designer, and even the set designer, because they also there was a boardwalk set. And they made the set sort of go away. And it was just this incredibly beautiful moment when, when all everybody's um, creative ideas got on the same wavelength. So that's an example on stage of, of what can happen. 
So everybody helps to tell the story. A mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I mean, I think we were lucky with Ragtime in that everybody working on the show uh, was qualified to do more than what their job description was. Uh, we were working with uh, Santo Laquasto, who was doing the costume designs, but he's also a wonderful set designer. And Lynn, who also writes, uh, who, who does, writes beautiful lyrics, also has written a book. And uh, Graciela, who is a wonderful choreographer, also is a director as well. So the fact that everyone uh, was informed by what everybody else did uh, led to a very successful collaboration and a lot of, uh, and, and it was encouraged, you know, for, for everybody to sort of cross-pollinate and, and uh, share their, their ideas, not just about what their department or their job description was. Uh, I'd like to add to that. Um that collaboration, no, let me go back to what Hal said, creative producers, I think it's, the, we need producers who put the right people in the room because that story Lynn told is very true. I would never have thought that was the problem with that scene. You need a genius lighter designer to figure that out or director. I had a play that uh, someone said, you're getting no laughs because the set is Battleship Gray and the producer paid a lot of money, painted it a warm Sardis red, and I turned into Neil Simon in 24 hours. <laughs> I, every line got a huge laugh, and, and I thought, they're right. Who knew that you can't do comedy in front of lead gray, and you can't sing back to before yeah, in front of a stormy gray. sky? But playwrights aren't supposed to know those things. You work with collaborators who know that, and I think it's the producer, whoever brings that group together in the room the first day of rehearsal, that's got to be the right choices and I always say a, a production or play is as good as its weakest link and sometime that weakest link can be a press agent who gives a terrible first release on the show and des describes it all wrong or gives away the murderer or whatever <laughs> and you're dead in the water and it's the stakes are really really high when you put on a new play because no one knows what it is we all find out together what Hamlet is about you know who it is now we all know, we, or we think we know, but <laughs> when they first did Hamlet, they didn't know what they had until they did it in front of an audience, and that's what's so exciting. Uh, there's an expression out there uh, that I hear again and again, and, and it gets applauded, and uh, the expression is, my way or the highway. It's like, you do things my way or else the heck with all of you. And it occurs to me that if everybody had that attitude, everybody would be on the highway and nobody would be doing any shows. Um, Part of collaboration is when there is a disagreement, <laughs> learning to win an argument without alienating the person you're collaborating with. Part of it is allowing the other person to get their way without you losing your passion for the project. How do you do that? What is the mechanism that happens in your head? Because to me, I think this goes to the essence of, of how to collaborate. How to say, well, you want that, I want this, Maybe we'll, here's, a, here's something that's halfway in between here is a compromise, or maybe the compromise won't work. Maybe we have to go with your way, maybe we have to go with my way. How do you draw that line? Anybody? It only works if the, if the most important thing to every single person involved is getting the play on. Otherwise, otherwise it's, it's tricky. And there are very, it, very different things happening in a, yeah. in a play that is really junk. Uh, and can be very popular, yeah. and a play that's very, very good. I have never seen a production of Uncle Vanya that made the play any better than the one Chekhov wrote, <laughs> for example. No matter what people do, no matter who's right. directing, who's acting, who's designing. <laughs> I've never seen that. Mm -hmm. And the creativity that has to be put into something that is no, nowhere near as good as Chekhov is, is enormous because everybody's got to compensate. <laughs> for not being Chekhov. But for, the for challenge you. is to make it as good as he wrote it. Yeah. It's impossible to do that, of course. Yeah. But the, the, the intent is to trust a, a, an author who knows what he's doing and try to a, accomplish in everybody's fashion what the author intended. But Chekhov, I think, is a very good example, Edward. A play, finally, or a musical, is a bunch of things in two dimensions on paper. The job of the I, theater I disagree, artist... I disagree with you totally. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm sorry, Chekhov's Vanya exists in a book. Hal Prince's production of Vanya is what we're here talking Chekhov's about. Chekhov's Uncle Vanya, if you know how to read a play, exists uh, when you read it. 
Well, I, since I don't read Russian, you're now we're talking about the translation. Ah. <laughs> uh, right. That's a cop-out, Terence. No, 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 I, no, I really think it's a big disagreement. I know you were very, uh, when Beckett was a state, I guess, did not want this production uh, that took place in the subway of Endgame. Yep. Then, you, and you said that uh, you have to absolutely observe the script. But you can say, the curtain goes up a room with two doors. Well, every door is different. Is it a door this tall or 80 feet tall? Is it gothic? Is it... So finally, we are talking about how these plays are interpreted and made into three dimensions, which is what I think Chekhov wanted to have happen. Well, no, I don't think he wanted his plays read. I think he wanted them performed. I certainly do, and I think you do too. I don't think a play should suffer from production when it, it, is, it, is, it is in its pristine state when you read it. Nobody's gotten at it to screw it up. Now, uh, Beckett knew what he was doing. He saw and he heard when he wrote exactly the way he wanted things to be. And the problem is, Beckett was right. And anybody who goes around screwing with Beckett ends up with something that's not quite as good as what Beckett intended. No. But this isn't true with all playwrights. Well, Shakespeare, uh, I mean, how do you, there are no stage directions, basically. Nobody knows what the original script was, either. Right. Well, uh, but I still, I go back to Endgame, a room with two doors. That doesn't say anything to me, a room with two doors. But now, we're, we're both, to both of the playwrights that you mentioned are no longer with us. Yeah. When you're actually in a room with the person that you're collaborating with, how do you have that give and take with the person that you're collaborating with? You know, in, in musicals, you're in a room with other people, sometimes one other person, sometimes two at the beginning, and I, I think it's very different for a playwright because that's a much more solitary endeavor. Um, for, for people right, working in the musical theater, um, you know, there's a, this little expression called check your ego at the door. We just get in there and, and start talking, and things bubble up. And sometimes, you know, yes, you have a disagreement, and generally what, what Stephen and I do is, is we agree to try it his way or to try it my way, and we'll see how it, it goes, and we'll leave it in there for a little while. But I think the bottom line is that nothing goes on the page and nothing goes on the stage that we both don't agree on. It just doesn't go there. Nobody forces anybody to do anything. And um, it is really, as Graziella Daniel always says, it's about the baby. It's mm. about the show that you're creating. It's not about, this is the best lyric I've ever written, or this is the most beautiful melody. Uh, you know, there's, there's always a bit of give and take. I think for a playwright, uh, you know, they're sitting with a blank piece of paper uh, alone in a room. And I, I'm very uh, in awe of that. And, and I think that, in a way, they're collaborating you know, I, I don't want to speak for the playwrights here, but yes, you create something that you feel is perfect on paper, and, and any other person who comes into the process adds a dimension that may make it better or may make it worse. No, not necessarily. Well, may make it different. Okay, but right. it's going to change it. <laughs> Mr. Prince, uh, the most the most dramatic example that I've experienced of a, a great play, and, and I think Long Day's Journey is a great play, is I I saw it originally. I think it, 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 four times the first week it opened mm -hmm. on Broadway, and uh, from upstairs. <laughs> that, uh, that, that great first cast. What? That great first cast was and, wonderful. Yeah, spectacular. But then I saw it again, and I've seen it again and again and again, and a very odd thing about that play, I saw it with Olivier then in London, the leading player in that play, the character that's central to the story, changed three mm. or four times for me, depending on mm. which production I mm -hmm. saw. And I liked every one of the productions. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it was the old man. Sometimes it was Jason's part. Sometimes it was the younger son. And the last time I saw it, well, actually, when I saw it in London with Olivier, it wasn't. It was the mother mm -hmm. who, whose story it was. Mm -hmm. So there are amazing things that can happen in the interpretation of a play. That's, that's, a that's perfect. the most dramatic you, I ever you, saw. You wouldn't have liked the production that I saw in Los Angeles that had been taken down from three and a half hours to about two and a half hours by the, the male star actor. We saw that in New York with the, the one with Jack Lemmon where they well, overlapped. Well, everybody was yeah. talking at the same time. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm talking about a, a, a worse one. Oh, worse. <laughs> You're talking about cutting. You're talking but, about cutting. But, uh, you know, back to Long Day's Journey, no one knew this play when it was first done. I saw the production, I was a student at Columbia, 
And it was general knowledge that it was a wonderful play, but the very weekly, role, weekly written role of the mother. In fact, I ran into Lynn Redgrave two years ago, and she said, my sister's coming to New York to do Long Day's Journey. And I said to her, Vanessa, it's a terrible part. I saw it on Broadway with Florence Eldridge. 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 Why do you want to do it? And Vanessa Redgrave said to her sister, I saw the movie with Katherine Hepburn, and the play is totally about the mother. So <laughs> everyone's perception of the play changes with these productions, which is what I'm saying, Edward. Plays do not exist on manuscript. They exist in the theater. And Chekhov knew that better than anyone because he, actors almost killed his first play, as you, we all know. He did, so. not, he did not compromise to, to be popular. Do, well, that's, that that's, is, a, that is, that's, the, that's, that's, that's the most corrupt compromise thing. Is, that's the most com worst thing that's being asked of playwrights more and more today. If you to, want to, to have a commercial success, compromise. Have you, have you ever been asked to compromise? A couple of times. Really? Yeah. Because I, I, I must say, I, I must say, I'd rather make my own mistakes than anybody else's. Yeah, but I don't find this as true in my life. People have said, "We'll do your play if you do X, Y, and Z," and I also have never heard anyone in the theater say, "Take my way or the highway." That's in All About Eve, which is my favorite movie. But no one in the theater, as I've ever seen, throw a mink coat down and storm out. <laughs> but but uh, I wish is, they would. It'd be much more interesting. That's the way a lot. That's they, the, that's the rather, way. We're rather normal people, I think, and hardworking, don't well, you? Well, that is yeah. the way a lot of people think of what happens backstage. What I'm trying to get to is. What does happen? How do you resolve? When I say a compromise, I don't necessarily mean people asking you to uh, bodlerize uh, your work or emasculate your work. I mean, when you're trying to achieve a particular moment in a play, compromise, when two people have a different vision on how to create that particular moment, how do you resolve that? Depends on, I think it always depends. Any specific example it that you have would depends. be great. Depends. Well, I, I think it's difficult because it depends on the two whatever two people are involved, sometimes the person with the most power in the room wins. In that circumstance, it's usually, it's quite often not a happy solution. I, I'll it, give an example. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, Please, I, go mean, I was much younger, a show which is not a, a great success, uh, The Rink, and there was, I was uh, very committed to the use of four-letter words in those days, and uh, <laughs> And there was a lot of pressure on me to remove some. There were too many fucks for the... And I refused, and I was going to go to the Dramatist Guild. Looking back, I don't think that's why the rink succeeded or did not succeed. Uh, but I stood up to it. You know, we have great contracts, as Edward will tell you. Hal, as producer, could never... Or you could never order one of your writers to change something. We're, we can say, Harry, how we disagree, but our What union's... is the point of the exercise? What is the point of going into the theater if you aren't predisposed to, get the thing to on. collaboration, mm -hmm. yeah, which right. is why we're all sitting here? Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you really can sit in a room somewhere. And I, I, the only experience I have, and it's happened twice, where I've been asked to direct a play and liked the play, and said, well, one was a play and one was a Michael Tippett opera, actually. And I turned to M Michael Tippett and the playwright who shall not be named, and I said, I have a bunch of questions. And he said, I don't want to discuss it. Do whatever you want. And I found that impossible. Yeah, I walked do. away from both projects. I, to, I do not understand the do whatever you want part of yeah. it at all. And it did happen to me twice. It works best when it's done when it's done together, and people, you know, if they're real disputes, in the end, it comes down to who who has the greatest stake. But usually, uh, a compromise is made because the theater is also an extraordinarily democratic undertaking. I think it's what Terence was saying. Everybody has to show up at the same place at the same time, day after day after day, to do what is uh, work. And what you want to do is move the work forward, and in the end you hope that what you're doing is, is, is illuminating, illuminating this thing that you have all agreed to work on together, because in the end it is the play that everyone's agreed to work on together. I think that 
uh, collaboration is much more common. I mean, there was a time when there were tyrants of one kind or another, either tyrannical directors or tyrannical actor managers. And um, I've only ever worked for one famously tyrannical director. Who? Um, Who? Tell us. Well, he's dead now. <laughs> And it was a horrifying experience, an experience in which there wasn't any collaboration. It was an exercise in this person um, exercising his power in a variety of ways. The thing that he made was extraordinarily successful and in some way almost entirely soulless. It was a machine. He turned the play into a machine that could have anyone in it. And it was uh, a very peculiar experience. And the only time, I, by the time I got to New York and got into the theater, such people were, weren't in vogue anymore. Um, but it was a, a, an awful experience, and people were destroyed in the making of the thing in ways that had nothing to do with whether or not the play was uh, better or worse or, uh, or more or less illuminated. And I think that's not, I honestly believe that that's not necessary. I believe that all the skills necessary for living a civilized life are the skills required to put on a play successfully. And that perhaps everyone should be involved in putting on plays <laughs> rather than whatever else they're doing most of the time. Well, uh, actually, I would like to take this mo this time to uh, to involve everybody. Um, I'd like to open up the uh, the floor to questions from the audience. Uh, if you have a question for all the panelists or an individual panelist, please uh, stand up, raise your hand, and I'll I'll point to you. And uh, if I do point to you, please stand up and sing out. <laughs> this young lady right here. You left out one person in this process. Uh, Who did? He did? Team, all of you. Oh. <laughs> the creative team and the audience. There's somebody that stands between the critic. <laughs> From my experience, he wouldn't be considered a collaborator so much as a conspirator. <laughs> <laughs> Can everyone hear? Because yeah. I'll repeat the question. If, if. From the point of view of someone who has just canceled two subscriptions to theater companies in New York, because the plays they've been putting on are absolutely idiotic. I was not, pre I was not protected against those plays by critics who were discerning. And that lady who gave you that good suggestion walking up the aisle, Mr. Prince, the critic didn't do that. The lady in the audience did that. Where are our critics and what is their function? The question is uh, the role of the critic as a collaborator or conspirator. And um, what the, uh, where the, if I understand your question correctly, where the critic stands as part of a collaboration? Or I think a, a conspiracy to be found in theory of theater. Ah, uh, accusing of, of critics, uh, people who defend uh, inferior theater. There's no uh, such thing as, critics? as the critic. There are a whole bunch of guys and a few gals out there who call themselves critics. Some of them are informed about the nature of theater. Some of them are very, very intelligent. Uh, some aren't terribly bright. Some of them like theater that is uh, escapist and, and, and middle brow. Uh, others uh, like theater that is only junk. Others like theater that, uh, that, uh, that, that tries to do something about, about the nature of theater. There's no such thing as the critic. Uh, it's a whole bunch of different people. Uh, some of them we like, some, some of them we despise. We, we love any critic, we, we, don't, we don't admit it in public. We like any critic who <laughs> likes our work. <laughs> but we are startled by the, the, our next play when they've lost their minds. <laughs> and they no longer like what we do. We know there are some critics who have an enemies list. We know there are some critics who love certain playwrights and despise others and wouldn't give them a fair shake if their lives depended upon it. There is no such thing as the critic. There is the person who reads the critic and really has to know, to find out what the critic means, what the critic is bringing to the task of being a critic. 
what the critic's standards are, what the critic's intelligence is, what the critic's honesty is. If you know all of that, you can read criticism intelligently. Otherwise, you're just reading a publicity blurb, either for or against the play. Mm -hmm. uh, when Mr. Birch and I were discussing who we were going to ask to write essays for Alchemy of Theater, we did discuss should we have a critic in here? And our feeling was, ultimately, we chose not to because we felt that by the time the critic sees it, the play is complete and mm -hmm. that they don't necessarily make changes based on what the critic has to say. So we felt that the, uh, the act of collaboration ended with, uh, before the critic came on the scene. So that was actually a, a, a choice. Do, were we wrong? Does I've anyone never, on the panel think I've we never thought of critics as being in any way a collaborator, no. ever. Right. I don't read reviews. <laughs> I can't. I, it paralyzes me, the good ones and the bad ones. So I stopped reading them after our first off-Broadway show. Um, I know a lot of people in the theater who do not read their own reviews. And I don't, I don't even like to read reviews of people I know, because I just feel I'd like to go and make up my own mind. I don't know who these people are. I can't make judgments on their intelligence or their education or their love of theater. And I can you know, disagree or agree with the reviews that they write, but you know, so what? I, I just... The, they're certainly not part of the alchemy of theater. No. no. So I, 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 I don't want to know what subscriptions you chose not to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I would like, no, I really, but I would like to say something. I would like to say, that more and more, if you're talking about New York theaters, more and more New York theaters are being pressured and influenced the way commercial producers have been pressured and influenced. Uh, there's something, uh, uh, if, if a play gets tried out uh, the, uh, in, a, in a theater, it, it is meant to be playing in that, in that theater for that audience, for you. It is not necessarily designed to move on and have a, a heady life commercially on Broadway. Nevertheless, that is in the back of certain people's minds, and along with that comes enhancement money uh, that goes to get productions done in theaters and so on. So what comes to play in what you're seeing unfortunately sometimes has nothing to do with the, the real purpose that established a theater in the first place and got you interested in being a subscriber. And that's, that's a, a misfortune, no question about it. The other thing, of course, Edward touched on is we're really just talking about taste. There, there are other things. There's bad humor sometimes. There are vendettas. There's all kinds of nonsense. But after all, we're all human beings, and, and alas, so are they. The point is, Part of uh, some of them. I knew I knew I could count on you. Uh, the point is, the point is essentially, though, you really are talking about taste. And there's one happy thing. Every everybody at this table, lucky enough, uh, luckily enough, has a career in the theater and is it has a. a, a pretty decent chance of choosing what their next move is and what they want to commit themselves to. There's no question about that. But that circumstance has gotten rarer and rarer and rarer. And I always, I, I knew way back when, when I was just a stage manager, that it must be tough for an, an out of work actress or actor or director to be offered something that they don't have any confidence in and turn that job down. Uh, that situation is worse today than it was then because there's simply less opportunity today than there was then. And that's very sad. I mean, I really have lived a whole life not being able to blame any production on anybody but myself. and. Uh, and sometimes because I just wanted to work and didn't have anything else to work on, so why don't I just exercise that muscle and do it? But uh, it's not the best reason to work, and the best reason to work is when you're committed to the material you're working on. However, at least I'm the one. The, the buck stops with me. And unfortunately, too many young directors, speaking of directors and actors, don't have the opportunity to turn down work. That's, that's, that's a a privilege. Any other questions? This young lady right here. This is a, sort of in the same vein as uh, the comments that Mr. Prince was just making, but I wondered if um, I could ask Mr. Albee to talk a little more about this concept of sawing off. And in that, 
Concept of what? Sawing off, how you're being requested as a playwright to saw off oh, oh. rough edges. Sandal. And I guess Sandal. along with that, you know, could Bertolt Brecht or, uh, or any of these, uh, you know, Waiting for Godot, could that be produced on Broadway? Well, uh, Brecht, Brecht, yeah, Brecht is not a very good example. <laughs> Brecht is not a very good example here because he, he changed his text depending upon the Communist Party line uh, month, to, month to month, but he was clever enough so he did a good job uh, 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 each time. The sawing off, the, the, the cutting down of the, of, of the tough edges that might injure somebody if they happen to go to the theater, that happens really with the beginning playwright much more than it does with somebody who's been around for a while and, can, and, and, and has learned how to say, no, fuck you, you do it my way or not at all. Because we all would rather make our own mistakes. But young playwrights are being more and more, especially in regional theaters and in the smaller theaters, which are all money losing and all are supported by members of the audience, wealthy members of the audience, who wish to determine the kind of play that is presented and the playwright is more and more asked to make his play the sort of thing that the audience will like rather than something that they will have an exciting time at. But there are also, Edward, young playwrights, thank God, who are starting their own theater companies. Yes, and because if you're an artist, you say what you want to say. I don't feel sorry for a playwright who says, MTC, I'll name a name, wants to do my play if I cut the following. Go to a place off, off, off Broadway. These theaters we're talking about that have these big subscriber bases are no longer entry level theaters. Mm -hmm. You did not start out on Broadway. I did not start out on Broadway. We, we started out off, off Broadway mm -hmm. at Cafe Chino and La Mama. And that's where you go. You don't go to a Broadway producer with your first play if it's cutting edge and you want to break new boundaries. And that's as it should be. So. I don't think it's harder to get your work done on Broadway, but I'm not sympathetic to a young writer who says no one will do my play unless I give it a happy ending. It's just I not true. I was true. talking about regional theaters more than Broadway here. The likelihood, well, I, I the likelihood of, yeah. of, of a new playwright getting his play done on Broadway is, is, is getting more and more remote as we talk. This is happening more in, in regional theaters. But in right. regional theaters, we've substituted, of course, for, uh, you know, I was talking about where the money comes from. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the same process. They have a board, you yeah. mentioned it. Yeah. And the board members have opinions. Uh, and sometimes those opinions are in direct relation to their contribution to, uh, to the, uh, the company. Uh, so uh, opinions are rife everywhere. They always were. They're only more dangerous now because I think the thought was that when you went to not-for-profit theater with your work, you would be avoiding Safe. the pressure of benefactors. And unfortunately, you're not, and I don't think anyone ever has, really, because all those companies have always had benefactors, and they've always had opinions. But as the costs have gone up, the power of the benefactors has increased. Yeah. Of course, exactly. And as the, as the level of public financing has gone down, mm -hmm. it's, uh, which is a terrible thing. The, the, the arts should be financed publicly. And there was a period in which the, the, at, the, at the birth of the National Endowment for the Arts, there was a wonderful idea. It wasn't entirely successful, the peer panel notion, but the idea that anyone should uh, insert political notions or whatever into the National Endowment uh, for the Arts uh, decisions was anathema. And after the Corcoran Gallery folded on the Maplethorpe question, you know the photographs, that was the thin edge of the wedge and it was also the beginning of the destruction of public financing mm -hmm. f for the arts because if public financing for the arts is not a project of the uh, of the society as a whole, it's doomed to fail. Um, and as that's gone away, then more and more now, more and more corporate. And I, I've been, I'm on the board of a number of not-for-profit theaters, and I've watched the way people have had to balance their funding. It, it began, you know, it used to be that the majority of even small theaters 
um, funding came from public financing of one kind or another. Then there were, you know, then there was lots of foundation financing because public money has gone, has disappeared. All the great foundations are now finding that they have to spend a great majority of their money to keep people alive. And uh, so there's less money for culture, and so it becomes more and more personal, and more and more a matter of large donors who all of a sudden feel that they have a right to interfere in the artistic decisions, and there have been a number of r really distressing uh, battles between the artistic side and the, and the board side in some... Exactly. <laughs> Another serious problem, of course, is, is the fact that there is practically no serious arts education in the public school system Absolutely. in this country. Question? Yes, this. Ma'am? <laughs> I think what I was probably saying is that the, the commercial pressures on a playwright uh, are less, the less amount of money is being invested in the production of his play. And so the smaller theater, the smaller, the friendlier theater, usually with a more responsive uh, uh, audience, is, is usually a, a, a happier environment. Uh, than, than, than a Broadway uh, production uh, may be. Uh, we are in vogue sometimes, and other time, times we're out of vogue. There was that period of 10 years where I was getting produced in Europe and, and around America, but I couldn't get a play on Broadway because I'd had five or six commercial disasters in a row. And apparently, that reflected on whether any play of mine could be any good just because I'd had commercial failures. But that happens, you're in vogue, you're out of vogue, but you go on run and you, and you do your business and, and you don't try to change who you are uh, to appeal to whatever the present taste of, of some people happens to be. You just go about your business. There's nobody at this table who hasn't had that experience. Mm. And what's wonderful about it is we're still sitting at this table. <laughs> and for the lady who... Uh, <laughs> the lady who asked about the critics, I think everyone at this table has lived through 50 critics uh, <laughs> on major newspapers, and we're still here. So uh, there's some comfort in that. There's some ability. I mean, you know, I had eight years where I couldn't do anything right. Eight years and eight productions. Mm -hmm. Nothing right. And uh, the only thing wrong with that whole experience was that I have a family, and they had to read those reviews the next day and accompany me to the opening nights and stuff. And it was, you know, I, I'd made the choice to do those plays, so I could handle it, but it didn't seem exactly fair. They hadn't made the choice to do those plays. <laughs> the point is that the eight years went away and were swept away and replaced by something else, and the only one who remembers them really well, I think, is me. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the point is, really, is uh, I would almost, uh, I'm very concerned right now that we get Broadway back because in my estimation, the best of Broadway, and boy, you have to go back certainly to look at a long list of the best of Broadway, is the best there ever was. And there's a simple reason for that. We live in New York. The collaborators are all generally gathered in one place. You can put together the best teams, and uh, you've got an audience uh, that, you see, that's what's so terrible, is you've got an audience that's desperate to see what you want to do, and you're not necessarily able to reach them 
with what you want to do. So my real passion is getting some creative producers back in there, and what I'm trying uh, with a, a group of colleagues is, uh, is a program whereby we can find who those people are and, and uh, recognizing that they have no financial resources and no way to find the capital they need and marry them to other people who have the capital and who uh, are willing in return for the good property and the good relationship with a creative producer to supply the funding. It's, it's a dream. We'll see if it happens. Uh, but, you know, we've been dreaming all our lives. So that's, but I really feel that way about Broadway. And I really, uh, I really, uh, I'm, I don't think we should give up on it. This gentleman all the way in the back. Yes. Yes, uh, Mr. Prince, uh, could you discuss your collaboration with Michael Bennett on Follies and Company? Please? Yeah, uh, I saw Michael Bennett's production of, oh God, he did the dances for a movie that that the name of which I'm going to forget, uh, with Donna Michi, and, and, and it was made into a musical. Uh, I don't remember the name oh, of it. I know. But, uh, yes, The World of Henry Orient. And I, I, I had not seen his work, and I thought, gee, this, this guy's really good. And uh, so I asked him to do, I, I, he came up to the office, and I, I told him about company, and he did company. Uh, uh, and did uh, very well, because there was a show with 14 people, uh, one of whom was a dancer, and everyone else danced about as well as I do. And, uh, and he made capital of that, because it added to the, the, the heft of the characters and the whole project. Then came Follies, and I asked him to do that, and he said, I, I, don't, I don't want it, I want to direct the next show I do. And I had had an earlier experience in life. I'd seen the same thing happen with George Abbott and Jerome Robbins on the Pajama Game, which is the first show I produced, co-produced. And Robbins said, no, I don't want to choreograph it, uh, but I want to co-direct it. And I went to Abbott and I said, uh, he said, does he want to do it? And I said, no. Well, what does he want? And I told him, he said, let him have it, please. What does it matter? And so when, when Michael Bennett mentioned that, I thought, gee, you know, I know what this Follies thing is. There's enough work for both of us. Uh, there was so much work for both of us that I don't think one director could have done it. So it turned out to be a very, very fruitful and excellent collaboration. And he worked all the time and I worked all the time. We just about made it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Ma'am? <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just say one thing, and that is that um, Stephen and I co-chair a program at the Dramatist Guild um, called the Dramatist Guild Fellows Program, and every year we select uh, ten emerging writers, five of them are playwrights and five of them are musical theater writers. And um, it's just one of a, a number of programs in New York, I think, workshop kind of situations where um, people who care about the future of the theater uh, try to help people such as you to learn their craft and have a community of writers. Um, and I would just say the first thing to do is join the Dramatist Guild and get their publications, uh, get that happening, because it's a very, very valuable um, way of finding groups, finding collaborators, finding people with common interests. There are lectures, there are seminars, that type of thing. I, that's my suggestion. I, I went to Columbia as an undergraduate. And there was no theater at all. Uh, it was minor Latham Theater, which was about it, and um, uh, my advice to you would be meet actors and give them your work and start doing it in basements, lobbies, wherever, but I, so many young writers think they've gotta get an agent first, or they've gotta send their script to a high-profile theater. Do 
re, you got to start your own theater. I think every generation starts from scratch and becomes the now uh, Rattlestick Theater. You know about that? Yeah. I mean, that's grown incredibly in six years. They're really getting reviewed by the New York Times. They've got wonderful new writers coming out of there. Five years ago, they couldn't get anyone to go in, but they stuck together. And you've got to do it, your generation. I don't think the odds of you sending a play to the public theater or Playwrights Horizon and getting accepted are probably one in a billion. But I think if you work, but actors are the key to it, I always found. When work is good, actors tell other actors, and suddenly someone calls you and said, I hear you've written a good play. And that's my advice. But you got to do it yourself. I think the most important thing is just hearing your work. You know, yeah. so off Terence's comment, you know, I think that this goes for any aspiring composers that are there because uh, really writing for the voice is writing for specific instruments and it's finding the, the singing actors uh, that are really excited about new work and I think you're absolutely right. I think it's you have to find that and build that uh, yourself and it not only enriches uh, the, collabor the collaboration between actor and composer but it really informs uh, the writing that we do, I, I think, you know, finding this particular voice who then um, uh, might unlock this particular role that I'm writing. You know, I think it's really important just finding people that are as excited about new work as you are and just rolling up your sleeves and, and writing and doing your thing. We went, I'll just add very quickly, we went, um, Stephen and I were invited up to Harvard to do a sort of master class up there. We were invited by a young guy named Michael Mitnick who had emerged from high school uh, and, and said, I want to work with you. I want to, please let me be your assistant. I'll get you coffee. I'll do anything. Please, please, please. So we had him, invited him to work with us on a production and he was fantastic. And then he worked with us on another production and then he went to Harvard and invited us to come up and speak. <laughs> and the funny thing was that there's no, no musical theater program at Harvard. Um, but everybody seems to be doing musical theater. And there was this huge full room of people who were so eager and so starved for, you know, some kind of community. And they're, they're doing it in, in basements and in dorm rooms and all over the place. So, you know, you're not alone in, in that, but, but they were making it happen, you know. And he, Michael just organized this whole thing and had us come up there. And um, it, was, it was really interesting. Trap playwrights wherever you can find them. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> for, force your plays on us. Because, you know, for very selfish reasons, we, we, we want to find talented new work simply because we get so tired of going to the theater and seeing stuff that we have no interest in and no respect for. We, we want, you know, you'd think that playwrights would be, be jealous of new talent or, or not want any competition. Uh, any art is the healthiest when everybody is doing wonderful work. And that's our goal, to have a theater where the only the good work uh, uh, is, is accepted. And so we need that. And the other thing I'd say is go to the theater. There are more than 400 functioning theater entities in New York City that have, that have enough identity to, be, to have a 4013C. So that means there must be 700 in the city that work. And go around and find people who are doing things that interest you. And find out who they are. And do what, put, make people read your plays, both out loud and at home. This gentleman. The question is to Mr. Albee, how do you collaborate with yourself? I collaborate with myself first by learning what uh, an awful lot of good people and first-rate writers have done uh, in the centuries uh, b before I'm around. I, I, I learn as much as I possibly can what to do and what not to do. Uh, I tell my, my students, don't only read great plays because you will despair. Read some stuff. <laughs> Read some stuff that isn't terribly good. It's enormously encouraging. 
Because you, ha you have to know what works and what doesn't work. You really have to familiarize yourself with the, with the entire canon of, of these people who really have been there to help you uh, fi find your own nature. And then I tell my students, then, when you've learned what everybody else before you has done, go out and write the first play that's ever been written. Very so good. So simple. Um, uh, I'm afraid our, our time is up now. Does anybody else want to have a final word on the subject of collaboration? And then we're, we'll uh, um, meet you folks outside. Yes, sir? I, I, I hate the man who has to have the final word. And I'm looking, and I see that look. But I, it, it, it's funny, it, it, I can't avoid it because it, it takes you back to the very first question you asked me about, about the, where I learned, who, from whom I learned. And the first thing I learned, and he didn't say it to me, he lived it, was from George Abbott. He, was, he, he lived to 107, and he had his last <laughs> successful show on Broadway at 93. Uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, I learned early on, because I never knew him when he wasn't 70. <laughs> uh, I, I learned from him that the best collaboration from his point of view, and I, I certainly copied him, copied this, took this from him, was to put together a group of experienced artists and one key person who hadn't yet gotten the experience, but had a, a real talent, a shining talent, a potential, and maybe a contemporary view that you and your experienced collaborators didn't have, didn't understand. And so I saw Abbott stay young uh, before I ever met him through shows like uh, On the Town, which was a collaboration with uh, Bernstein, Robbins, Comden and Green, all of them in their middle 20s, all fresh and new, and the old man knew how to bridle them in so they could get a show on that worked, but the spirit of that show was theirs. And the technique and the building blocks that you're talking about were his. And I have tried always to have one key member of the artistic team, someone who has not had a lot of experience in the theater, but has a voice. Uh, it very often is the designer, uh, be because Boris died. Uh, but I when mean, I have it, a daughter for you. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's the point. That, that I th I thought probably I wanted to hear myself say that. <laughs> I would like to ask one question to all of you in the in, in regard to collaboration and, and alchemy. What was the most unusual collaboration? most unusual idea that you got from the most unexpected source that worked in something you were doing? Hmm. One anecdote from anyone. For me, I think it was seeing my first play, The Zoo Story, in its world premiere in Berlin, Germany, in German, seeing my first play in a language that I didn't speak, mm. <laughs> and spending most of the time watching the way the audience was responding uh, uh, to, what, to what I had done. That was a, 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 a very enlightening experience. Uh, I, mine is very uh, short, working with Elaine May as a very young man, because my first play, I didn't know what I was doing, except we did everything wrong. And then I worked with her, and I learned that uh, a playwright has to know the action, the behavior. Which was the first play, Terrence? The behavior and things that go bump in the night. Oh, that one. Uh, that but that I'm now talking about next, where was that the I first, don't the know. Was that the first one? No, I wrote a play which you love to belabor me with, yes. uh, <laughs> <laughs> which was done in a workshop that Edward sponsored. And he says, Why do you never mention this play? I said, Because it was performed for a workshop. Uh, can we talk about your trunk full of <laughs> verse drama? <laughs> <laughs> Quite large. <laughs> I only have one, so watch it. <laughs> but at any rate, I do think uh, 
<laughs> I guess that's where Edward and I do disagree that I think maybe Edward has a more literary approach to theater than I do, that Elaine was very big on behavior. And I don't think they teach you that at Columbia about behavior, and I think a playwright. That's why I think Shakespeare is a great one to read, because it's, it's so much behavior with incredible language, too. But, um, so Elaine May was, I think we all meet someone we learn a lot from, and we are eternally grateful to that person. They open, they open the door, then it's up to us to go in and possess the room they've let us into. Well, thank you all for opening oh, doors for all of us. And thank you all for coming out tonight. Oh, I didn't mean to. I love that.